Welcome to our first virtual Birds and Beer. I'm going to give a little introduction for all the new folks who may be tuning in tonight with no prior experience with us or this event. So my name is Morgan Moore and I work for Audubon Arizona, which is the state office of the National Audubon Society. Our mission is to protect birds and the places they need today and tomorrow using science, advocacy, education, and on the ground conservation. Before working from home, our office was in the Nina Mason Pulliam Rio Salado Audubon Center, a nature center located in Phoenix, Arizona. The center is currently closed, but we welcome folks who can drop by after we reopen. Birds and Beer is our monthly conservation happy hour lecture series. Folks usually get together and have a beer from our event partner, Arizona Wilderness Brewing Co. before sitting down to a presentation about birds, other wildlife, Audubon's work, or any conservation related topic. We've partnered with so many different people and groups for this event, including Tempe Bicycle Action Group, Liberty Wildlife, and Wild at Heart, and our thoughts go out to all of them right now. And I want to acknowledge these times that we're in. We hope you, your family, and your friends are all taking care of themselves and staying safe and healthy. The COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic has pretty much reached every corner of our livelihoods, and it's been impossible to try and ignore it and continue on with our lives as we knew them. And yet, at least here in Arizona, birds are picking up little sticks and twigs on the ground and flying off to build their nests, reminding me of new life on the way and the resilience in all living things. So whether it's outside, through a window, or online, I hope you can find some peace in watching the birds right now. So back to this webinar. I am going to put out a disclaimer that this is my first webinar through Zoom and also my first time using Facebook Live. So please bear with me if the technology doesn't run perfectly. I would also so appreciate as long, I guess I was going to say, I would appreciate if participants would keep their video off, but as long as you're being respectful and appropriate, then I'm fine with it. And I will also field questions at the very end for our presenter. You can ask through your chat box, um, whether that's the Zoom chat box or the Facebook Live chat box. We will likely not get through every question. If this is the case, I will try to figure out a way we can address them online later. And so everyone's aware, again, this webinar is being recorded. So the moment you've all been waiting for, our presenter, Dr. Kelsey McCoon, is a postdoctoral scholar at the University of Cal California, Santa Barbara, currently working at Arizona State University. She is a behavioral ecologist interested in the evolution of individual differences in behavior and cognition in wild animals. She believes it is important to measure animal behaviors in the physical and social contexts in which they evolved so she focuses her research on animal groups in the field, including today's topic, the great-tailed grackle. So please welcome Dr. McCoon as she presents the grackle project. And let's see if I can unmute you. Hello. Hey there. Hi. Is my audio is coming through? Yes. Okay. All okay. right. Go ahead and share your screen now as well. Okay, does that look good? This is also my first time using Zoom, so great. Um, okay, so welcome everybody. It's so great to see so many of you tuning in from your homes. I hope that I can make the social isolation a little bit more enjoyable tonight. Um, so my name is Kelsey McCune, and as Morgan told us, I am a postdoctoral researcher on the Greco Project. And for those of you that don't know, that means that I've already done my PhD and now I'm doing more research, uh, but I am working with my supervisor, Karina Logan. And the Grackle Project is really her brainchild. And so I came onto the project and I've contributed in several different ways. And we're really working together to try to make this a really interesting and impactful project. Uh, so Karina is employed through the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology. And I wanted to bring that up because even though 
Our field site is hosted here in Arizona at Arizona State University. Uh, Max Planck generously funds our project and does a lot of the logistics and management. So I wanted to give them a shout out. Also, I wanted to give a shout out to my two awesome coworkers, Maggie McPherson and Melissa Folsom. I couldn't do most of what we do on the Grackle project every day without them. Okay, so now I think that we are ready to talk about behavioral flexibility in the Great Tail Grackle. So I think we all recognize that human modified environments are increasing at an extremely rapid pace. And so although animals might evolve an environment that looks like this, a lot of greenery and wildlife, some habit, habitat fragments, humans come in and we like to create these extremely novel environments with like a lot of these weird structures that species have not evolved to deal with. So if you evolved in a habitat like this, then all of your behaviors and your morphology are suited perfectly for this habitat and not for this habitat. So despite this, there are some species that actually do really well in living and reproducing in habitat that looks like this, that humans have altered. The great-tailed grackle is a great example, and that's why we're talking about this today. But for those of you in Arizona, uh, an alternative example might be the black-throated sparrow. So you would find the black-throated sparrow anytime you go out of the city, into the desert a little bit, but you will never ever see one in Phoenix or Tempe, whichever suburb you live in. So we're really interested in understanding how come we see this species difference in adapting to human modified novel environments. And we think that behavioral flexibility could be the key. So what is behavioral flexibility? Well, we like to say that a person that is not behaviorally flexible is like someone who has only one tool. So to a person with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So this tool is their one behavior that they have to deal with any circumstance that comes at them from the environment. So if you only have one tool, then instead of using a screwdriver to try to get this screw into this piece of wood, you're gonna try to do it with your hammer and it's not gonna work out very well. Or maybe you're trying to mix up some cookies and you use a hammer. This is your only tool you can use instead of a mixer. And so on with maybe cracking nuts. A hammer is probably going to pulverize all the meat in that walnut, not going to do as good of a job as this nut cracker, cracker would. And the same thing with a shovel. So we define behavioral flexibility as the ability to change behavior when circumstances change. And this is almost always based on learning from previous experience. So you're able to use a new tool from your toolbox to address different problems. And so what we wanna answer with the Grackle project is whether behavioral flexibility is important in the range expansion of the species. And we're assuming that individuals probably need to rely on behavioral flexibility to rapidly adapt to the new environments that they're encountering. And what are these new environments? Well, the great-tailed grackle is a really great study species because they are uh, originally from Central America. So for those of you that are not familiar, this map that we're looking at is an e-bird map. And so as the color goes from light purple to dark purple, that's essentially showing an increase in density of grackles. I think it's something like the number of e-bird lists that are reporting grackles in a given region. So you can see that down here in their uh, original environment, the color is much darker showing a higher density of grackles. But they have, they have been pushing the range further and further north through time. And that means that they're having to cross all of these different kinds of habitats. So a couple different deserts and they're moving further and further north where it gets a lot colder in the winter. So they are a tropical species, but living pretty successfully here in Arizona. And they have gotten as far north as Canada, and you can imagine it's probably pretty cold for them up there. Um, I think some of the more northern populations are migratory to help with that. The other great thing about the great-tailed grackle is unlike other non-native species in the United States, the great-tailed grackle is currently in the process of expanding its range. So you can compare that with the starling. 
where their expansion has already been complete. So we're not really able to look at the individuals on the edge of the range and see if they're different in some way from individuals at the original, in the original portion of the range. So for a little historical context, the grackles were first seen in the United States in about 1900. And then their population just expanded extremely rapidly. So from 1880 to 2000, their population expanded over 5,000%. And as many of you who maybe have encountered grackles in your daily life can guess, it's possible that this is because the great-tailed grackle is really, really good at taking advantage of human byproducts. So here we have a female great-tailed grackle, they're brown, and she's just stolen this French fry out of this garbage can. And over here is our male great-tailed grackle, and they're black and bigger than the females. And he appears to be trying to eat mayonnaise out of this sauce packet. So it's something that we can all see when we're out and about and grackles are around that they seem to be flexible at finding food sources wherever they go. But it's one thing to sort of notice that and have anecdotes and it's another to actually measure it and quantify it in a rigorous way. So that's what we're hoping to do. So in the first part of this talk, I will tell you about how we're measuring behavioral flexibility and whether grackles are behaviorally flexible. And then in the second part of the talk, I'm gonna tell you about, uh, well, really I'm gonna to touch on a few of the other things that we measure on the Grackle Project. I don't have enough time to tell you about all of them, but we measure a bunch of other traits to try to understand why some individuals might be behaviorally flexible while others aren't. Maybe it's an underlying reason like cognitive ability, different personality types or um, physiological measures, or it could be the proximity of the population of grackles that we're studying to the range edge. Okay. So to answer any of these questions, we have to catch the grackles first. And here in Arizona, they're actually pretty difficult to catch. They're very suspicious. And so we use two different kinds of traps to try to throw them off. The first is a bonut trap, which is here in this top picture. And once the grackle has come into the very back of the trap, we're able to press a remote trigger. And this releases this little pin. The top half of the bow comes over, oopsies. The top half of the bow comes over the grackle and there's a net in between and the grackle is caught. The other type of trap that we use is called a mist net. And some of you bird people out there might be familiar with this. It's a pretty common way to catch birds. So a mist net, for those of you that don't know, is essentially like a very large volleyball net where the thread is extremely fine. And so you set this net up in a shaded area where the grackles are flying around and because the thread is so fine, they can't see it, they fly into it and get tangled. So here in this picture, we actually have a mist net still set up. It's, it's across this entire picture, but because the thread is fine, you can't really see it. And we're extracting a female from that here in the foreground. And then here's a more of a close up picture so you can see a little bit more detail on the thread and what it looks like when a grackle is tangled in it. So I do wanna point out that we have uh, a slew of permits to be able to do this work with the grackles. We have local, state, federal, federal, and animal care and use permits. And we also have specialized training to allow us to be able to trap and extract the grackles from the traps safely. So once we have the grackles in hand, we give them two color bands so we can tell them apart when we release them back into the wild. We take a blood sample and we do a, a bunch of different body measurements like bill length and tarsus length, which is this part of their leg. Um, and we also measure their fat, things like that. Uh, and then the majority of the grackles that we catch, we actually release again at the location where we caught them. And a subset we take into aviaries or cages on campus. And this is where we do all of our behavioral testing. 
So this is Adobo, and he was one of our male grackles. You'll see him a couple times throughout this presentation. So we measure behavioral flexibility when the grackles are in the aviaries, and we use a method called reversal learning in order to get at this trait of behavioral flexibility. And to measure reversal learning, we use these two containers, we call them tubes because the food goes in this tube part, that are dark gray and light gray. So the first phase of this experiment is not behavioral flexibility. The first phase is learning speed. So we first have to get the grackle to learn that there's always food in one color of tube. So for adobo, that's the dark gray tube. So we put both the tubes in his cage on a trial and the dark gray tube has food in it and the light gray tube does not. And adobo comes down and he gets to make one choice, just one for each trial. So he might look in the light gray tube and there's nothing there and he doesn't understand. But then on the next trial, if he looks in the dark gray tube, he sees the food and then he's maybe starting to make a connection. And after several trials, 10 to 15 maybe, he learns that he should always go to only the dark gray tube to get food. Once he's hit this phase, he's passed the first part of the experiment and he's ready for the reversal period. Uh, so I will tell you about that in a minute. First, I wanted to show you a video of what our um, experimental setup looks like. Let me turn off the volume somehow. Uh, There's not really anything to hear, it's just loud. Okay, so he knows to go down and look immediately in the dark gray tube and he gets his cracker piece. So that was one trial. And because we have to do many trials, we have to go in and take the tubes away and add more food. And so to reach the, the point where they've sort of proven to us that they know the food is always in one color of the tube, they have to get 17 trials right out of 20. So that means they, they have to go always to the dark gray tube on 17 trials and they are only allowed to miss three. And he gets it right again. Okay. Morgan, were you able to hear me when that is muted for the video? We could hear you talking, yes. Okay, good. I just wanted to check. <laughs> yep, video was silent. Uh, no, first I wanna tell you how we do the reversal portion of the experiment. So after the grackles have shown that they know the food is in the dark gray tube, they move on to uh, the portion of the experiment where we're able to measure behavioral flexibility. And it's really simple. All we do is switch the food to the light gray container. So if you remember our definition of behavioral flexibility, it's the ability of an individual to change its behavior when circumstances change. So by putting the food in the light gray tube, we've changed the circumstance and we're going to measure how long, how many trials it takes for the bird to change its behavior. Okay. Okay, so originally Karina used this method to test grackles in Santa Barbara as sort of her pre preliminary population. And what I'm showing you here are some results for the number of trials that it took birds to pass each portion of the experiment. So the grackles in Santa Barbara were actually really good at initially learning where the food was. So 20 is the minimum number of trials that you could possibly have. And they did a really good job. They were able to learn very fast where the food, which color of tube the food was in. Then when we switched where the food was and put it in the other color of tube, so here is our measure of behavioral flexibility, it did take the grackles more trials to figure that out. So this is very interesting, 
but how do we know what behavioral flex, what is behavioral flexibility? Is 70 a low enough number of trials? Is 130 too much to be considered behaviorally flexible? To be able to understand how relatively flexible grackles are, we have to compare them to other species. So luckily there have been other species that have been tested with this method. And if we're just looking at the initial phase of the experiment, we found that the great-tailed grackle is similar to California scrub jays, Darwin's finches, and pigeons. And they're actually faster than pinion jays, um, Clark's nutcrackers, and another study on California scrub jays. And when we look at the reversal speed or the measure of behavioral flexibility, we find that grackles are actually doing even better. So now they're similar to Darwin's finches, but they're faster than all of the other species. And for those of you other bird nerds out in the audience, you might recognize that pinion jays, nutcrackers, and scrub jays are all members of the corvid family, which is the notoriously smart bird family in, um, in the bird world. And so it's really cool that we found grackles were able to do better on this test than these species. So since then, we've tested about 17 birds in Arizona, and I'm not showing all of, you, all of them here, just a portion of them that fit on the screen. But what I want you to notice is that the initial learning speed is pretty similar to what we saw with the Santa Barbara grackles. We have more variability because we have a larger sample size, but we did have birds that were able to pass in 20 trials and some in the middle. And when we look at the reversal speed, which is again, our measure of behavioral flexibility, it almost looks like the ones in Arizona are even able to do it a little bit faster. So in both cases, we're seeing um, individual differences in behavioral flexibility and that overall they were, they were both, uh, both populations are showing behavioral flexibility. So in answer to our first question, are grackles behaviorally flexible? Yes. We saw that they were able to change their behavior when the circumstance changed, and this was based on learning from previous experience. Okay, so now I'm going to touch on several of the other aspects of our project. And uh, not, again, not able to show you all of them, but at the end of the talk, I'll show you a way that you can find out about all of the aspects of our project. Okay, so like you saw in that table, there is individual variation in how behaviorally flexible grackles are in Arizona. And we wanna understand why that might be. So is it related to some cognitive trait or personality trait? Perhaps it's related to a physiological measure as well. So. We uh, do several different experiments to measure different types of cognition, two types of personality, and I'm gonna show you some of these next. Uh, from the blood samples that we take, we measure several different things. So we're looking at immunity with the white blood cells, hormones, uh, blood parasites. We're also looking at genetic relatedness and reproductive fitness. And we look at how measures of body size relate to these things as as well. So all of these physiological measures are going to be completed in cl collaboration with these awesome people listed down here. So I don't really have any of the data on that right now to tell you about, but just so you know, we're doing it. And if you have questions about it, I could try to answer them to um, the best of my ability. So we are also interested in how population averages change relative to the proximity to the range edge. And to do that, we have to move the Grackle project from Arizona here in July, actually. So we've been here since 2017, collected a lot of data. And in July, we're going to move to Northern California and we're gonna collect all of the same data. And we chose this area because as you can tell by the colors on this eBird map, there's not that many grackles there. So these are grackles that are still pushing into novel environments, still potentially experiencing different circumstances that they're gonna have to change their behavior to. 
but there are enough grackles here for us to have a large enough sample size to test all of these questions. At the end of a year in California, the whole project is actually going to move to Panama for a year. And again, we're going to collect all the same data there. And Panama is thought to be the original center of the range. So here, it, it would be interesting to see if the grackles are different in any way than the ones that are on the northern edge of the range, because these grackles potentially have never encountered much novelty relative to the environment that they evolved in. Uh, so this is the Santa Barbara population. This was the preliminary data. So I do just want to point out that we have behavioral flexibility with the reversal tubes from this population, but pretty much none of the other experiments were done in that population. Okay. Okay, so now I'm going to touch on some of the other things that we are testing the birds for in the aviaries. So I told you about the uh, reversal learning using the tubes to measure behavioral flexibility. And we wanted to know if our method is a good method for measuring this trait. In other words, can we see if individuals will perform similarly if they're given um, a behavioral flexibility task in a different context? So we taught the grackles how to use touch screens. So guard your phones if you live in Arizona. Um, and we wanted to do a very similar reversal learning experiment just using a touch screen. And if the birds perform similarly with the touch screen as they do with the tubes, then we would know that in both cases, the methods are measuring behavioral flexibility. Instead of dark gray and light gray, we have two different shapes here. So a pentagon and a diamond. Um, and I had a, a question about this when I showed this uh, presentation to somebody else beforehand. Um, we actually had to test out <laughs> what stimuli we're going to work on the test screen before we finally settled on these shapes. I know they look a little strange, but these seem to be the ones that were the most um, salient to the grackles. The, the first shapes that we used were uh, circles that were different colors, and it freaked the grackles out. I think they thought that they were eyes and they found it very threatening. So we had to do some testing after that to figure out what would work better. Uh, so the, in the same way as with the reversal learning tubes, with the touch screen, a bird is rewarded for pecking at a particular shape. So either the pentagon or the diamond, if they peck at the right one, they get a food reward. And this is what that looks like. So. I'm going to show you Tapa. I wanted to have a bit of a sex balance in our, our videos that I showed you. And Tapa is rewarded for touching the diamond. Oh, let me, sorry. <laughs> let me mute the video, the video volume again. Okay. So she likes to participate. She comes down right away. She picks the right shape. And then she's able to get food out of this compartment down here. What's actually happening is this food container back here, it's called a hopper. When she chooses the right shape, it raises into a position that she can reach it through a hole in the bottom of that compartment. So she picked the wrong shape that time. And so she doesn't get a food reward and we give her a delay before she gets the next trial. Okay, so she picks the right one again that time. Notice she's only been pecking on the right side of the screen. So before she, we can say that she passes this experiment, we wanna make sure that she knows to go to the left if that's where the rewarded shape is as well. And she can. So I wanted to talk about this experiment because it's one of the only times that I'm gonna be able to give you some results. So, the, if you remember from the table that I showed you for the reversal learning tube results, the number of trials it takes birds with the, the tubes to be able to learn that the color is now in a, that the food is now in a different color of tubes, it was a max of 130. For the reversal learning touch screen, the grackles found this much harder to learn. So this is probably Tapa's 413th through 417th or so trial. So for whatever reason, using the touch screen just 
did not click for them. They were not able to quickly learn that one shape meant food. And maybe that's not surprising because a touch screen is maybe not that ecologically relevant for bird species. They don't really interact with anything that looks like a touch screen in the wild that's going to give them food. And it's possible that's why that they were, that's why they were not able to learn this task as quickly. Um, so we've since stopped doing this task. It took way too much of our time. Uh, but it was interesting to see that using physical objects seemed to be a lot more um, salient to these individuals and they were able to perform better. Okay. So the next thing I wanna show you are our experiments that we do with these two different puzzle boxes. So in e even though they look different, each puzzle box has four options for getting a food item. So over here, this is actually a puzzle box that I used during my PhD to look at problem solving in J's. And each compartment is covered by a door that opens in a different way. So the birds have to figure out how the door works, how to get it open to get the food. This puzzle box only has uh, essentially one compartment, just one place where the food is, but there's four different options for accessing it. And usually there's a clear plastic top that goes over this area right here. So they can't just hop on top and reach in and get the food. It's a little hard to see, but the cracker is sitting on top of a pedestal. And when the bird successfully uses one of these options, it falls off the ped pedestal and out of the box. So this is a measure of problem solving because we're looking at how long it takes for the grackle to understand what each of the options does to be able to reach the food. Okay, so here's what this looks like. Again, we're gonna see adobo here. Uh, so I'm setting my stopwatch. They get 10 minutes to come down and interact with the task. Adobo was happy to do anything that we wanted him to, so he usually came down right away. He's going to kind of assess what's going on, figure out how he wants to tackle this challenge. And he gets the food using the shovel option. So the cracker piece rolled out, and he's going to grab it. Okay, so if you'll notice, I also have behavioral flexibility written on this video, and that's because after a bird learns how to solve one of the options, we make it uh, non-functional. And that means that essentially it's going to look like this. So it's still on there, but he can't use it to access the food anymore. And this is, again, we're changing the circumstance and we're going to measure how long it takes takes for Adobo to change his behavior and go to any of the other options to access the food. So we wanted to make this sort of a multi-purpose method. Not only can we measure problem solving, but we can also get another measure of behavioral flexibility in a different context. And we do this with both of the puzzle boxes. Okay, so next I'm gonna tell you about our um, methods to measure two different personality traits. The first one is exploration. So exploration is defined as the motivation to investigate something novel without needing to uh, access it for food or water. So this is trying to get at the inherent maybe curiosity of an individual. They don't need to go check it out, but maybe if they look into it, they might find something good. So we use this novel environment. This is actually a tent made for cats. So I thought this was appropriate to show to a group of people at the Audubon because um, it's better to keep your cat indoors so that it doesn't eat wildlife. And if your cat still wants to go outside, now you can take it outside in this nice tent. It can have all of the sensory enjoyment of being outside, but not endangering any wildlife. So you could buy these on Amazon, and this is also a great way to measure exploration in gray-tailed grackles. So we want them to only go to the tent, only get close to the tent if they choose to. So we keep their water back here in the back so that they can go to their water still without getting close to the tent. And their food is always at the front. So again, they can go eat if they want. They don't have to go to the tent. We're interested in those grackles that want to. 
Okay, so I'm going to show you a video of what that looks like. And this is our participant, Mole. Okay, so he comes down first, goes to his water. Not sure what he's going to do. Oh, he wants to get right on it. So um, we saw a lot of variability <laughs> in the bird's responses to this novel environment. He gets distracted and he wants to go check out his neighbor. He can see the feet sometimes underneath the barrier, but then he goes right back to the tent. A lot of the other grackles didn't approach the tent at all. Some of them didn't even come to the ground. So this was a good method to elicit a lot of individual variation in exploratory tendency. So uh, this method, we put the tent in the, in the aviary for 45 minutes and the experimenter is out of view for the entire time so as not to influence their grackles behavior. And I will tell you that for almost the entire 45 minutes, Mole is all over this tent. He's inside it, pecking at different things on the inside. He gets on top. He even like picks off some of his leaves and drags them over the top of the tent to just kind of see what's gonna happen. Um, and he was the most exploratory grackle that we've seen. He, this is the most extreme way that the grackles in our sample have thus far interacted with the tent. So it's really cool to see the variation among the grackles. Uh, you can't really see it, but I do want to point out that he does have food up here as well, just in case you're wondering. The second personality trait that we measure is called boldness. And boldness is an individual's response to threat. And this can be a novel threat like we have here with this purple Halloween cat, or this can be a familiar threat, like we use a stuffed Cooper's hawk. And we have seen here in um, Tempe, Arizona, Cooper's hawks chasing and trying to attack the grackles. So we know that they recognize a Cooper's hawk as a threat. Uh, we also use a pigeon. Um, so grackles do interact a lot with pigeons here in the wild, especially around the food sources that we put out to help catch the grackles. And the pigeons are almost always dominant to the grackles, but they're not going to kill a grackle. So we use this as a, a neutral threat. So this is kind of a control for just having something weird in your aviary. Okay, so we're going to see mole again. And for each threatening object, we do those on different days. So they only see one threat at a time. And the other thing to note here is that we do food deprive the birds before they get this experiment. And so they're, they're gonna be hungry. And then we put the threatening object in with a food item close by. So now the bird is experiencing conflicting motivations. It's hungry, it wants to go close to the object to get the food, but it's also scared. So boldness is really which of those things is gonna win out. They go get the food, they're bold, or they stay up on their perch they're more shy. You guys might be able to guess based on how Mole interacted with the tent, which one he is going to be. Um, he comes down almost right away. This is within a minute of the trial, and he jumps on the Cooper's Hawks, the Cooper Hawks, Cooper's Hawk head. That's a lot of apostrophes. And uh, he jumps up and down on the head a little bit. He even pecks at the head. Um, of this poor Cooper's hawk. And this is before he even goes to the food. Um, so for this trial, we only put the threatening object in for 10 minutes because it's potentially very threatening and affecting to the bird. And for humane reason, we don't keep it in for 45 minutes like we did with the exploration tests. So he finally goes and gets the cracker. Um, so again, this was in about one to two minutes in on this trial, he eats the cracker, sits on his plant for a little bit, and then he actually comes back and starts jumping on the Cooper's hawk a little bit more. So he was a very special bird. And we can say that he was definitely more bold relative to the other grackles that we tested with this experiment. Okay, so those are all the tests in the aviaries that I'm gonna tell you about. Um, after the birds are done with the slew of experiments that we give them in the aviaries, we release them again into the wild. And we wanna be able to find them again 
so that we can measure their natural behavior. And to do that, we give them a little backpack with a radio tag on it. And so for those of you that don't know, the, this is their harness, this is their little backpack, this is the radio tag, and it emits a unique radio frequency. So each bird has a different frequency. Um, these loops go over the legs and it's hard to see, but there's an antenna that comes off the tag and that's, that amplifies the signal. And then we have an antenna and a receiver box to be able to pick up the signal. And it allows us to really hone in on where the bird is at. Um, this is important because now that we have all of these measures, it's like very individual level data on the grackles from the aviaries, their boldness, their exploration, their behavioral flexibility, several different cognitive traits. We wanna know what does that mean for how they behave in the wild? Do the ones that are more behaviorally flexible in the aviaries, are they also eating more human food? Do they use a wider variety of foraging techniques? Do they hang out with more other grackles? So we measure social behavior, foraging behavior. We also measure their space use. So are the ones that are more exploratory when interacting with the tent and the aviaries also seen across a wider array of locations on campus? So they have a, a larger home range size. We don't know. And that's, that's why we're collecting all of these data, both in the aviaries and in the wild. Okay. So in conclusion, we wanted to know first, is this species, which is rapidly expanding its range, the great-tailed grackle, are they behaviorally flexible? And we found that yes, they definitely are behaviorally flexible in relation to the other species that have been measured. And then we wanted to know whether behavioral flexibility is related to any of these other traits that I mentioned, cognition, personality, physiology, and whether it might vary by location along the, the range and proximity to the edge of the range. And as you might guess, given that Arizona is our first study site, you're going to have to wait and stay tuned for the answers to those questions until we complete all of our data collection at the different areas along the range. So I wanted to point you to some more resources in case you were really intrigued and you wanted to know more about the things that I wasn't able to cover in this time. So please check out my supervisor's website. You can also take a look at my website and I have some information on here about the work that I did for my PhD on J's for any of you Corvid lovers out there. And if you're interested in the other experiments that we conduct or more details about the ones that I told you about, we post all of our experimental proposals here on this website. This is a bit different than what people usually do, but we like to have open and accessible science here on the graphical project. So we create an idea for an experiment, we write a proposal, and then we usually, um, for almost all of the experiments now, we've gotten them pre-study peer reviewed. That means that we send our experimental proposal to our peers in the field. They give us suggestions, maybe they criticize it, they ask us to add or change things. We make those revisions and then we resubmit it and it is accepted. This method allows us to create experiments that are more rigorous and impactful. And it also holds us accountable for collecting the data and using the data in the way that we initially set out to. So please check out those if you're interested and I can now answer any questions. Thank you so much, Kelsey, that was amazing. And definitely the video too. Stop sharing my screen for this. Oh, it's, it's, I think you can keep it up oh, if you'd like. Sorry, <laughs> I had my computer mute, muted still. Okay, I can hear you now. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Thank you so much. If this was in our Nature Center, we would be giving you a huge round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I will start off with a few questions that I actually got um, through email before the presentation. Oh, cool. Um, so this kind of speaks to where they were originally. Um, so gray-tailed grackles seem, seem to be mainly found close to where there is human activity and much less in secluded areas. Is this true? And if it is true, has it, this always been the case or is this a more recent adaptation? 
Yeah, so I think this is a more recent adaptation. I think um, grackles tend to be, well, in the, the original portion of the range, I do think there are some that are associated with human dominated areas, but I also think that they behave um, more similarly to other blackbirds where they nest in uh, marshy areas like cattails and um, forage on more natural food types. Thank you for that. And why are they seen in parking lots? <laughs> uh, I always ask myself that as well. I, I see grackles all the time in parking lots. And then when I stop to watch them, I figure out the answer to my question. It's because people are really bad about uh, containing their food inside their cars or inside the food packaging. And there's constantly food crumbs, um, trash, like takeout bags in the parking lots. Um, sometimes people are purposely throwing the grackles food, food, but I think a lot of times it's just stuff that is dropped. Okay. And so here's probably another question that you either ask yourself a lot or like you probably get from a lot of people is why are they often looking straight up with their beaks to the sky? <laughs> Yeah, so just like the picture on the flyer. So um, I was happy that that was there because this is, it's very time appropriate. So that is a um, courtship and dominance display. So it's called the head up and the males do that to each other to secure um, the prime breeding territory during the breeding season. They'll also do it to each other in the non breeding season to um, secure the, a food resource. So um, in the animal kingdom, uh, they don't have doctors. <laughs> so if they get in a fight and they get hurt, it's likely gonna lead to infection and possibly death. Um, to avoid that, they use a lot of visual signals to size each other up to figure out who would actually win a fight if it was gonna happen. So by putting their heads up in the air like that, it's kind of a proxy for looking at um, who has the bigger body size. And I, it's, possible that it also has to do with endurance like who can keep their head up for the longest without coming down um, to look around or take a drink of water good to know thanks for it that was not asked by me but a question that i had myself um, yes yeah, so they also do like a uh they also like fluff up really big and spread their tails <laughs> that's called the rough out that's usually in conjunction with the head up display it's very silly looking mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so this question was asked back when you were showing the trials with the um tubes of food um they wanted to know how far apart are the trials time wise so the for that experiment, the birds are allowed five minutes to come down to the tubes. And as soon as they come down to the tubes and make a choice, whether it's correct or not, we take the tubes away, we rebate it, and we put it back in. So the, the trials are between 30 seconds and a minute spaced apart, depending on how slow you are at rebating the tubes and, and getting them set up. Okay, thank you. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you said that the, um, when you were comparing how well grackles did to other birds, you also said the ones in Arizona did better than the ones in California. Is that right? Yes. So it looks like the grackles in Arizona are, are a little bit faster at behavioral flexibility. So they're able to change their behavior to looking into the previously unrewarded color of tube in a fewer number of trials than the ones from Santa Barbara. But the sample size was pretty small in Santa Barbara. Do you have like a hypothesis as to why that would be? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I Since I wasn't in Santa Barbara to collect the data, I'm not sure what the habitat was like there. One thing I can say is that because we're on a college campus, the grackles are constantly having to deal with new challenges. So people are either chasing them or they're trying to hand them food really close up and there's all different kinds of food items 
um, many different cuisines really. And uh, so I think that the amount of novel objects is probably much higher than it was in Santa Barbara where um, I believe the field site was in a marshy area near to the zoo. Interesting. Uh, is my internet okay? I just got a warning about it. Um, your voice was a little wonky for a second, but you didn't cut out at all. Okay. Okay, so next question. Do grackles see the same things on the touch screen? And I think they mean as do they do they see the same thing that humans do on the touch screen and aren't their eyes different than human eyes? Yes, this is a great question. And um, we, the, the touch screen experiments are uh, created in conjunction with a, sorry, a, a collaborator at um, UCLA. And I, I think he's a psychologist, I'm not sure. And he works with pigeons on touch screens and he's looked in depth at the, the visual perceptual abilities of pigeons compared to humans in terms of, are they seeing the same thing on the screen as we are? And that's another reason why we chose the stimuli to look that particular way. Um, we also had to make sure to get screens that um, presented the stimuli with uh, light that was appropriate for them. And they had already tested all this out with pigeons. Okay, thank you. So here's one. Grackles being so social, I might expect avian flu and malarias would hit their populations disproportionately hard. Do they have better immunity? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not, I'm not very well versed in um, microbiology or virology. Um, I'm not very well versed in bird diseases. I think they do get West Nile, but at I'm not sure how much that affects them. We did have in Arizona, I think didn't, last summer, didn't we have some West Nile cases from the mosquitoes? I'm not sure, but the, it's hard to tell how sick the grackles are because they try to behave the same until they're too sick and then they kind of just die. And that's because if you look weak at, at all in any way, a predator is gonna take advantage and is gonna kill you. So usually they're not showing exterior symptoms of being sick. So since we haven't yet looked at all of the um, immunity data, all of our white blood cell counts, I can't really say how healthy or how good their immune systems are relative to other species, unfortunately. Oh, no worries. That is an interesting note though, that just the way that they act trying to hide things, very like machismo of them. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen it as well. Like sometimes a grackle missing its entire beak will not act oh. like it's hurt in any way whatsoever. It's so yeah. strange. Um, have you ever given them a test that requires solving two puzzles? Like a two-step test, if that's the question? I think uh, so, answer. yeah. Okay. Um, so that's not, that's not quite part of the Grackle project. So there's a couple of answers here. The first is that um, check out my supervisor's website. She used to work with New Caledonian crows, um, which are the tool using species of crows that have shown up a lot on um, popular science media. And she did teach them to step problem solving tasks. Um, the second answer is we, have an experiment that kind of involves that, but it's not working super well at the moment. So um, when I was a PhD student and I was studying Jays, I was uh, using that puzzle box that I showed you. And if you noticed from the picture, there are the regular plastic doors, but there's also sticks on there and those are locks for the doors. So the birds had to first take the lock out and then open the door. So that was a two step task that we used with the Jays. And um, we still plan to use that with the grackles. We're just having some logistical difficulties right now. Okay. How do you decide which birds to run these behavioral tests on? And I guess like, how did you come to choosing gray-tailed grackle? 
Uh, yeah, so um, the great-tailed grackle is a good study species because it's, first of all, it, it like I was talking about, it um, seems like it should have behavioral flexibility based on the way it's expanded its range so rapidly and its ability to deal with human modified environments. The second interesting thing about gray-tailed grackles is um, unlike corvid species, their brain size to body size ratio is not quite as large. So people don't expect them to be smart and there's not the same evolutionary history of large brain smart birds. So that means that um, any way that they're dealing with the environment is the way that they're able to adapt and doesn't require really large brains. And so that's potentially interesting for its own reasons. Okay. And what unique role do you think grackles play in the bird community? <laughs> Uh, well, they definitely give us joy. <laughs> um, some people, from, from the people that I've talked to, it seems like people either love or hate grackles, and they are very charismatic. Um, I don't, they, they are non-native in the U.S., and I don't think they're technically considered invasive by the federal government, um, because they don't have at least as far as we know, a huge detrimental impact on native wildlife. So I think there's been one study that shows that they can predate uh, white-winged dove nests. And so white-winged doves are native. And so that is detrimental, but otherwise they're, they're sort of using habitat in a way that's not too bad to the native wildlife. And um, they, <laughs> they clean up our trash <laughs> by eating it. And they, they're also insectivores. So they do keep the bug levels down in that way too. Okay. So someone says, we recently have had a number of grackles take up residence in a nearby tree and they have definitely made their presence known. Do you know how they decide to pick a tree as a group? Yeah, okay. That's a great question because that's one of my current sort of side project interests. Um, because we have the radio tags on some of these great-tailed grackles, we're able to follow them anytime we want. And so grackles are uh, a communally roosting species. That means at night, they get together in the hundreds of grackles and they all go to one place to sleep for the night. So a lot of times that's somebody's backyard tree or bush. And uh, before they go to sleep, they have a lot of raucous chatting. <laughs> Um, and so we follow our grackles to the roost at night because it's, it, it's an interesting, it's interesting data point in terms of their space use. So how far away from campus are they willing to go to find a safe place to sleep? So it's a, a it could potentially be related to their exploration or something, something else. Um, and we've noticed that the roosts don't stay the same like you would expect them to, like you see in other species of birds, where sometimes a grackle will go to one roost, and another time it will go to a roost on the total other side of town. And um, I don't know that anybody really knows why this is. Some people think that they're, it's kind of accidental, where it's kind of a, um, like a domino effect where one bird goes and sits in a tree and then there's social attraction where because there's the one grackle in the tree, other grackles also come to that tree. And this kind of just happens until it's too dark and that's where they end up roosting. Um, the other, so that's kind of like a, it's a byproduct basically of their social behavior. The other hypothesis about how they choose a roost site is that it's, um, it's beneficial in some way. So it's extra safe or it's in a location that's really close to a really good food spot that they can hit like first thing in the morning or last thing before night so that they can make sure that they don't starve overnight or something like that. Um, so because I, this is the first time that I've ever worked with roosting species, it's been really interesting to me to think about these questions. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I bet you've, you know, like the, wonder and maybe pain that they cause on the Avenue too and those huge trees. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I have not yet followed any of our grackles to Mill Avenue for a roost. Kind of surprises huh. me. Interesting. So someone's wondering if after selecting the correct tube for the food during the trials, did any of the grackles check out the other tube after selecting the correct one? Uh, yes, yeah. so we only let them make one choice. So as soon as, even if they look in the incorrect one, um, a lot of them actually do try to be super sneaky and run to the other one. Um, we have to be paying very close attention. So they make one choice and then we have to like go into the aviary to take the tubes away and they will cheat if you're not quick enough. So it's, it's funny, but it's also <laughs> something we really try hard to avoid because we want them to learn that they have to make the right choice. They have to remember which color has the food in it. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> They're like humans. Yes. <laughs> like, like toddlers, maybe. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, do they mate for life? No, they don't even mate to one person, one grackle for the season. And males uh, are not faithful to one female. So their, their mating season, I'm sorry, their mating system involves a male defending breeding territory, which in Arizona are usually the date palm trees, but sometimes they use other trees as well. So a male will defend one to a couple date palm trees, and then females will come and check him out, see if they like the way he looks, see if they like the way that the tree looks. And if they do, then they'll start building a nest in his tree. And usually he's the one that follows there's the offspring. Sometimes he's not. Sometimes it's a neighbor male. Um, and then multiple females will build nests in the same tree. And within the tree, the females do compete with each other. So um, if there are too many females building nests in the tree, then they'll usually like gang up and, and try to kick each other out. And was I correct in hearing um or maybe reading that you found, at least in the population you're studying here in Arizona, that the males were taking care of the young more often? Yes, yes, you said, did some background, Very nice. <laughs> background <Did>. research. <laughs> Um, yes, that is that is another very cool result that I can tell you right now. Um, it's almost never been seen before, except here in our Arizona population, but we have evidence that the males are providing parental care in the form of feeding the, we call them fledglings. So for non-bird people, that means once the baby bird leaves the nest, it's fledged the nest. And so it's kind of independent, but it's not really that good at doing anything and it needs to be fed by its parents. And in the great-tailed grackles previously to, previous to um, our research in Arizona, we thought only the females did that. And so here we found that the males are actually providing parental care. It's not all the males. And so we are doing some extra things to try to figure out why particular males are feeding fledglings and others are not. That's pretty cool to hear though. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you select food that the grackles can't smell and is there no other, is there no way other than guessing for them to know where the food was in your experiment? That's a good question. Um, to be honest, we didn't test which food the grackles could smell. Um, the reason that we don't have to is because for one, a lot of birds aren't known to have very good senses of smell. And the other is that the crackers have been all over both kinds of tubes, both colors of tubes. And so uh, theoretically they should smell equally like goldfish crackers. Um, and so the, the idea is that the only way for the grackles to choose a tube is to remember from past experience, which color of tube has had the food in it. Um, we make sure we point the tubes towards the, the walls of the aviary because usually the grackles are sitting on the back perches and they, that way they can't cheat and look inside of the open end of the tube to see which one has the food in it. Usually we're also using relatively small pieces of cracker so they don't fill up. And that makes it so that the cracker pieces are pretty far at the back and hard to see, even if it was angled more towards where they were perching. Good. 
All right. Well, it is 735 and I've got through almost all of the questions, but I want oh, to great everyone's time here. Um, so thank you again. We really appreciate having you. Um, and I think this kind of shows that, uh, like this is a great format to have birds and beer. And we're so glad that you could be our first virtual birds and beer presenter. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And it's been really fun. I think this is a great way to do public outreach about the research we're doing. Yeah, definitely. And for any lasting questions, um, I will try and connect our presenter with them in any way, shape or form and follow up with you guys soon as we can. So thank you everyone. And thank you, Kelsey. <laughs> thank you. Have thank a good you. night. Have a good night, everyone.